All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Darlene Phillips. I'm the co-host for the podcast this morning. Our host is John Scar, and our guest speaker is Mr. Spike Moss. Good morning, gentlemen. Okay, so I'm thinking that we should just jump right into this because I have so many questions, and I'm hoping that I'm hitting it dead on the nail for the community so we can get to know who Mr. Spike Moss is. So I've done a little bit of research. So I'm going to need Mr. Spike Moss to um, to make some clarification on this for me. So in one of the pieces that I read on Spike, I read that the, one of the press papers here in Minnesota calls uh, Spike a civil rights leader. Then down below I read where he describes himself as a freedom fighter. So my question to us, to you, sir, is which one of these things describe you the most accurate, a civil rights leader or a freedom fighter, and what is the difference? A freedom fighter. We've always needed nothing but freedom. Uh, Civil rights is another terminology for property. We're no longer America's Caucasian property. Uh, We should have fought for human rights. We still need human rights. All of that comes under freedom. So what America does is they spin the narrative to their comfort. And their comfort is to call you an activist, which means you never bring up the fact we're no longer and have never been free since the day we got on the first ships. So once you say freedom fighter, they say, who took your freedom? That comes back to them. They don't want it to come back to them. So they spent the narrative and called you an activist. Before that, you called, they called you troublemaker. They called you activist. You see what I'm saying? So you were a troublemaker, an activist, or a black militant. But you never were a freedom fighter when, in fact, the whole battle is nothing but freedom and the lack and denial of freedom. That's what you're fighting about. Explain to us what is it that you exactly do? Um, what kind of work do you do with inside the community and for the community? Most of my life, I did human rights cases. And back then, when the civil rights office was in, in downtown Minneapolis, I did civil rights cases uh, for a year and uh So in 1966, 67, I switched over uh, to the Black Power Movement because black people had absolutely no power in this country of any level that would help them build businesses, uh, create wealth, uh, go to school. Any of the things that normal people did in America, you were denied, Uh, even though if they didn't use the word Jim Crow, Jim Crow was used against you. So we needed power. You know, uh, the Civil Rights Movement was let's fight for the right to vote. The Black Power Movement was, let's fight for the right to vote and run for office. Civil Rights said, let's fight for the right to go to white schools. The Black Power Movement said, build better schools and bring us black teachers. Mm -hmm. Civil Rights said, let's fight to go inside and sit down at restaurants. Black Power said, let's own the restaurants in our own community. So it put us on a different level. We became a threat to America because the one thing America didn't want was a people that they oppressed to be empowered. And we were fighting to empower the people. And without the power, these other things happen to you that absolutely should not. And civil rights doesn't beat down the door to any of that. It will allow you to go in a white restaurant and sit down. However, when you look at the government center, it sits across the street from uh, the courthouse. Mm -hmm. So if you're at the government center looking at the courthouse and you turn to your right, there's a building there, a Christian building, but that was the block where Charlie's Restaurant was. Charlie's didn't go out of business until the 80s in Minneapolis, kitty corner from the courthouse, and never allowed us to be seated to eat in that restaurant downtown Minneapolis across the street from the courthouse. When you look back at your life, what are like the major benchmarks in your mind, like where you felt that you were fulfilling your purpose in life? Um, like what were those events that, that can... L- helped you continue on your path as a leader? I'd say in my memory of um, my grandparents, my mother, uh, my mother's brothers, um, my grandmother, my father's side, her sons, uh, just teaching me what the family had went through, um, setting me on their knees, setting me on the porch, and every one of them wanted to share what the family went through, you know? And my my father's uh, grandmother, which was my great-grandmother, Melissa, they lived at Vaden, Mississippi. And uh, her father, Charlie, he was Native American. 
and he built up apple arch orchard and he was making money selling apples apple pies uh, apple cider and he was doing well but what came into that part of the of the country was native americans and blacks standing up way back then for the right to vote on a given day the few people who cared about him came to him and told him that they're going to kill you this week so he stayed visible on the streets of Vaden while the family got away to Missouri and then he went. And then years later, when they didn't make contact, they said the white people burnt all the barns, the home, and the fields to the ground. Um, when my last great uncle died, um, I was at the hospital with him. And I bent down in his ear and I remember telling him that I will be the first Bailey to ever go back home. I will go back home. I will find the family. And I was successful. On my mother's side, the story began with my birth my first fight for freedom. In the town we lived, you could go in town, cross the railroad track, and there was a big hospital, but it was whites only, blacks never allowed, just like the school, blacks never allowed, because I was born in Jim Crow. Um, my first three brothers and sisters all died on that kitchen table in my granddad's house. You have no nurse, you have no doctor. If there's any problems, that's, that's it. They take a face cloth, wrap it around a butter knife handle, and. You bite down and you holler and you scream and they holler push. And the first three brothers and sisters didn't make it. I, I made it. They then gave me their middle names, but they made sure I knew the story of why I was special and important to them. But I would add with it, 30% of my mother's family died trying to make a journey of 170 miles to the nearest hospital that would accept blacks. You couldn't get an ambulance that far, so it wouldn't be no point in calling. But when you get in the car, you've got to drive. Many of her relatives died in the car or at the door of the hospital because that was the nearest uh, hospital we could go to. Being that Jim Crow, uh, one of the reasons I think she left and brought us here was you couldn't go to public school, you couldn't go to the library, you couldn't go to the park, you couldn't swim in the swimming pool, you couldn't go to the movie show, you couldn't really have a man's job, you could have a boy's job. It was just so much hate and so much racism. And Missouri has, different than a lot of states, Missouri has the KKK from one end to the other. A lot of states don't have that. They might have a chapter, but not like Missouri, where it goes from the top to the bottom. So that was the beginning of uh, understanding that we're treated differently. But then my mother's uh, third oldest brother, when I was a teenager, about 15, he said, come on, little Spike, we're going uptown. And we jumped in, he had a bathed Chevrolet. We jumped in the Chevrolet, and he drove uptown, and he walked in the front door of a white establishment. Well, you could lose your life doing that. And the argument started, and they were hollering, and they were screaming and telling him and calling him out of his name and what he better do. And he said, my name is James Batzel. I fought in your war. My money spins in the front. It don't spin in the back no more. It spins in the front like yours now. The owner said, give him what he wanted. Get him out of here. When he walked back to the car, he stuck the key in the ignition, and he just looked over at me. And he never said a word. But what I heard was, freedom is right here, but you have to stand up like a man to get it. So those two things were on me. And I'm sitting there watching TV here, and I'm watching black people in the restaurants getting beat for sitting down at the countertop. So every Sunday we'd go to the show and we'd walk downtown Minneapolis and um, I was 12 years old. And so we came out of the show, I said, let's walk around there on Nicollet where the counters are because at the counters uh, it was Dayton's, Donaldson's, Penny's, um, R.S. Kresge's, Woolworth's, Snyder's, all these things were there and they all had soda fountains. And then right with a napkin counter, I said, we don't serve colors. So I was looking forward to doing what I seen on TV at 12 years old. So, so I go in there, and I sit down. I tell the kids to sit down. They don't even know. You know, I tell them to sit down. And they say, you know you can't sit here. So well, you just give us some water. We'll leave. So they bought us these Dixie cups with points so you can't set them down. They just got points. You got to hold it. Said, okay, you can leave now. We'll leave soon we get done drinking. I turned to the little kids. I said, sip slow. You know? <laughs> and this was my first first protest my mother didn't even know <laughs> that I had did it it made it back the north side of lie <laughs> that was the first one and uh, I just kept learning and learning every time I went home you know I witnessed something but once I really understood Minneapolis I said we ain't went that far 
because the federal government came in and, and where Sumner Field Park is, they built the projects. And the Sumner Field Park was in the middle. It's today called Heritage Park neighborhood. But on the, on the east side was projects and on the west side is projects, but the federal government in the state of Minnesota wouldn't allow you to mix. So we had to stay on the east side of federal built projects from our tax dollar and they stay on the west side no mixing in my generation. But we mixed in the park. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how crazy it was. But you knew uh, as a teenager, 15, you couldn't walk on Plymouth Avenue. You knew you couldn't go over Northeast, and you knew you couldn't go through Golden Valley. So there was just too many messages. Uh, my mother said she was 17, and all she wanted to be was a nurse. So when she came home from work one day, she said, I found out you can go to nursing school here. You can go to nursing school. She was all excited and everything. And uh, she went to nursing school. And so there was a big graduation party at the house. All the relatives came when she graduated. But after the time and the money, Minnesota did not share with those black people, doctors and nurses, we won't hire no black doctors and nurses nowhere in Minnesota. My mother then turned to doing daycare, day work, where you're scrubbing floors and toilets. Mm -hmm. I got a job at 15 at Henry Hamburger. And I'm working there. And I got a job at the Glenwood V store, and I'm working there, and I got full of myself. I'm going to catch the bus. I'm going over there where my mama is. I'm going to get her up off her knees because I can take care of her now. My dad's taking care of all the bills in the house. He's working all these jobs, but I want my mom to get up. So I drove the bus. I rode the bus out there, and I asked the lady at the door where my mother was. She said she's in the bathroom, what I should have expected. She's down on her hands and knees with a bucket scrubbing. And I said, Mom, you ain't got to work no more. I got two jobs. I said, you can get up off your knees now, Ma. You tell me which check you want. It's yours. And she's scrubbing. She looked up at me. She said, son, don't worry about that. I'm all right. I was so mad that I pouted all the way home on the bus. I pouted. It took me six months to understand what I saw that day. I witnessed that my mother was broken because the thing she loved the most was denied her. And I finally had to just realistically deal with it. They broke my mama. And she never, ever became the nurse that she was. I think those type of things gave me a journey and responsibility. The most hateful thing that happened to me down there in the summer, all my cousins play baseball. My uncles and their uncles and fathers, everybody's in the Negro League. If you know anything about Missouri, that was the heart of the Negro League. That's where Satchel Page is from. Mm -hmm. So we all imitated and mimicked them. That's what we did. We threw the ball like them. We built our build on our hat like them. We put dust on our hat like them. We put dust on our pants. We slid and ran and threw just like an adult because we were mimicking and imitating them. Mm -hmm. We got so good in our area that the white team decided we're going to play that black team because they didn't play us. They had their own league. They didn't play us. So they said they're going to play us. We got excited. We run around telling everybody we're going to play this white team, so on, so on. And nobody cares. Nobody's getting excited. Well, we're young. We don't know why. The day came for the game. Nobody's coming. We in that stadium, we got everything in us that we saw our uncles and cousins do. And we tore that behind up. We broke out in a 12-point lead, right? Game over. Game over. The white people get up, push the bullpen over. They were prepared if we won. They had baseball bats. And they started beating black kids 10, 11 years old. And we ran out of the parade stadium. And this one hurts me. The whole way you're running, you hear them hollering and screaming. We got to the covered bridge and the pickup truck was blocking the bridge. Couldn't get back into town. So you got a choice. You got to get in that Missouri Salt River full of water moccasins and current, or you take the whooping. We chose the river because we never was allowed to go in town to the swimming pool anyway. We always swam in the river. We had confidence we could get across. And you're swimming to get across. And all you hear is the pain of the kids you grew up with, the pain of the kids that's your cousins. And I was at River McAfee's church for Black History one year, speaking, and I brought it up. 
And I said, after that day, a little kid that knew I'm going to play baseball when I'm grown, never thought about playing baseball another game. That one still hurts. So it wasn't an anger thing for me. It was a liberation thing for me. When are we going to be treated as human beings? When are we going to be treated as people? When are we going to get our respect? When are we going to go where we want, be where we want? Because when we walked on Plymouth Avenue as teenagers, where you boys going? We're going up here to the bakery. Turn around and go back. If you don't go back, you end up in the river getting beat up down there, or you're in jail. We didn't even know there was a Broadway because we weren't allowed to walk on Plymouth to the 60s. So when you understand that, um, there's enough things going wrong here that I didn't need the South. But because I got a double dose, because I'm in the South every summer, my mind and my heart was about the liberation of our people. And the more they told me no, the harder I fought. So I fought police cases for 56 years. I fought human rights and civil rights since 1966. I fought for our right to have most jobs, our right to be police officers, our right to have rank, our right to run precincts in our community, our right to be school teachers, our right to be principals, our right to build the new North and the new Franklin that's in the community, our right to drive the city bus. The firefighters was a long fight, but we fought it every step of the way. You couldn't work in the stores as a clerk selling anything. We fought for the right to do that in Donaldson's and Dayton's. We fought for the right to work in construction and we fought for the right to work on the freeway when they were building in 94. Um, all of those victories were because the teenagers of the North Side were dedicated and committed for the rights of our people. I was so far ahead of them, I just became their leader. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the stories that you shared here with us are definitely touching and moving. And um, I could see, um, like, the pain that it causes. So my next question for you is, um, what do you think that it will take for the community? Because, um, like, we just did that election a um, couple of weeks ago for the um, attorney general, the mm -hmm. governor, um, and we did the phone bank here. Um, and it's kind of tough, like, connecting with the black community. So um, is there a thing or a purpose that we could give or even make the black community aware of how important their voices are? Because like the things you just spoke about that you fought through, you came through, you lived through, you seen those things, but the whole time you're talking, for me, I see it, the way you're describing it and giving it to me, and then it's maddening just to think the black people today, like how less involved they're into the change of the community. Like they feel like they don't need to be involved in it. So um, what do you think that it would take to get the community to come more forth to the voting table, mm. uh, being involved in how to move the community forward. Because I see um, daily mm -hmm. on the news, um, parents, grandparents upset about the gun violence. And they always want to label it black on black violence. Mm. And we killing each other anyway, so why is we mad? Um, what will it take for the community to stop holding themselves in bondage? Because you fought through some good bondage stuff. Mm -hmm. You fought for people to be able to stand up, for people to be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. But um, lots of people, they're not doing it, Spike. So do you have any kind of word or maybe a direction that we could give the community to bring them out, to be more involved? Well, I say that's two parts. The, the yeah. first part is... The word used back then is the same word you need now, organize, organize, organize. The one facility that belongs to you that no one can control is your churches. You should have been using your churches to organize and teach, organize and teach so we can move. One of the things that the Jewish community has done well in this country is they take their synagogues on Saturday and would teach young Jewish kids what it is to be Jewish. 
So that means you got total clarity. You don't teach your people what it is to be an African person born in America. Um, he made us slaves. We're so confused we call ourselves slaves. We were not slaves. We were made to be slaves when African people, who were they? Human beings. From where? The continent of Africa. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So you have to go in the churches and rebuild them in their minds and their hearts. And then you have to replant the value in them of human rights, the value in them of freedom and justice. Because they have witnessed so much abuse, they automatically don't believe going to the polls will help. Or America would change. Well, it's hard to go against that for this reason. 150 years, you were put on slave ships, four and 500 deep. 240 years before they so-called abolished slavery, you were in slavery. Some white people who refused to quit lasted two to three years after that mm -hmm. 240, hiding you in the woods with stakes and things in the ground and working you through the day or in the evening when folks couldn't see you. Mm -hmm. So no one came forth from this nation to stop slavery. Even Lincoln, it was brought to him from Frederick Douglass. Lincoln never responded to what Frederick Douglass was talking about. His greatest speech was, I'll, I'll, slave, I'll free all the slaves to save the Union, half the slaves to save the Union, no slaves to save the Union. He just needed to save the Union. He didn't want to be the embarrassment that the country split up under his watch and the South was Confederate and the North was what it was. You see what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. so there was nobody there. So in black people's hearts, that's all they've ever witnessed. What we can't do, what we can't have, where we can't be, where we can't live. So in their mind, there's so much disbelief, you got to set them down. The way we're sitting down here talking, you got to have the freedom to have open conversations and dialogue about facts and reality. You see what I'm saying? And they, they know nothing about it. Now, why did that happen? To stop the movement. The strength of the movement that they were afraid of was not the old people. They were marching peacefully. It was the young people who were rebelling, who were willing to fight and die. They had to stop that and take it in another direction. The direction was exploitation movies. I'm going to do all these movies where you're going to hate your woman, call her B's and H's. You're going to beat her. You're going to fill her up with cocaine. You'll kill her. You'll kill each other. And we came out of the movie talking about what a great movie it was, mm -hmm. straight through the 70s. Mm -hmm. The next move was they took hip-hop, turned it into rap. And they came to him. I want you to say these words in your song. Oh, I can't call my people that. I'll give you $5,000 more. I think the song will sell better. Mm -hmm. you so into yourself and your broken ego and trying to get Thank some you. money. you calling me the N-word all through your song. That's one of the lyrics of your song. You're yeah. calling our women B's and H's, one of the lyrics of your song. Well, common sense will tell you. White people are the majority of the music industry. Yep. When have you heard them sell a white song where a white man was calling white women B's and H's? Or, putting them, or calling them white trash. Any you of the things that white people, most of the labels that you hear, well, I won't say most, all the labels you hear depicting white people in a bad way, that was one white group attacking another white group with labels, right? Mm -hmm. So, But you never hear those labels in the songs is my point. I directed your kids to do what? Sing it. You're singing it as adults in your car. Who's in the car with you? Your, your children. Kids. You're playing it in your house. Who's listening to it? Your children. Then the children come out of the house and they act out what they see on the screen and they act out what they hear in their ear. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the N-word now has took the place of African people. Mm -hmm. You see, we said B so much, black women and black girls call each other mm -hmm. B. So what I did is I, what they call, mastered you and trained you no different than a dog. You take a dog, when the mailman comes, I mean, uh, the the paper boy comes and drops the paper. You send the dog to grab it. Mm -hmm. The dog don't know what paper means. You just taught him that's the paper. Get it. He don't read the paper. He don't understand the paper. Mm -hmm. But because you mastered him, going to run and get it when you tell him. We are running and getting it when he tell us. And so he led you down this trail away from being African people, away from your culture, away from your history, away from your, your religion. No one has had religion in the world longer than you, and you don't even have a clue most of the religions that swept the world were yours. And the strongest religion you ever was involved in and ever created was called Christianity. You were what was called 
Coptic Christians in the middle of Africa, most countries have went Christian. But how many of them know that was you? How many of them know that the Bible itself, and I won't deny it was tampered with 30 sometimes, then the Greeks tampered with it, the Romans tampered with it, but the original version is one of the oldest history books about you. The only one that don't know that's about you is you. you. I was speaking at Carlton College and there was nuns in the second row and they had a burning question for you, Mr. Moss. And I said, go ahead with your question. Well, Mr. Moss, as nuns, we just want to know what difference does it make what color Jesus is? I said, ma'am, I can answer you in a religious way. I was raised in the church. I said, but I'm just answer you as an African-American. If it didn't make no difference what color he was, why did you change him? And I left it right there. So when you understand and you're learning, you can defend, you can speak up, you can teach. The, the Caucasian don't, don't, don't know he's your children who treats you like there's no connection and like there's some separation because he has pale skin. Well, that began with the albinos. If it wouldn't have happened with the albinos, those chiefs wouldn't have took the albinos up in the Caucasian and Caucasian mountains and left them there and created what's called the caveman that came down and created Europe. So... The lack of history, lack of knowledge of history, I can twist you any way I want. So I got you twisted, but then I did one other thing. In the 60s and 70s, I flooded the black community across America with heroin mm -hmm. to knock out the soldiers. When you started recovering, I flooded with cocaine. With cocaine. Mm -hmm. When you still kept coming, I flooded it with crack cocaine. So I got you docile, I got you crazy, I got you in prison, I got you defeated, and I got you where you don't know who you are. Now I don't have to worry about your rise. I'm worried about your rise, not your fall. I'm worried about your rise. And everything that's done is to hold your rise down. So where we can vote, we have no choice. And we can say what we want about what they won't vote, but the problem is how can they really vote with conscience and they're not well? We did everything to make sure they're not well. Yeah. So even when we take them in the church, you're going to have this argument. Let me tell you, my greatest enemy in the Twin Cities was not white people. It's your own race of people. That's who spread the rumors. That's who told the lie. Master said, <laughs> oh, Master said, and then they carried it out. The white people that were loyal to me never left me. And every venture I ever did, they did it. When I did my music school, for example, think about it now. Eight to nine bands a year. There's a place over here called the Guthrie, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. His daughter was Louise McCallan. Um, she, once I got you done, would give me the money to give you the instruments and the amps. All you got to do is name yourself now. What's your band going to be? White woman. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So it's all through my career including when I built the new way, white man, Russ Ewald. I've never, um, General Mills, uh, Russ Ewald, they, McKnight was something like eight to nine hundred million a year. The Minneapolis Foundation with Jim Shannon, it never left me. When I walked, I walked on my own, regardless of what they did, they were not going to stop funding me, and they didn't. So I'm just saying that we had more white people aware when I'm coming through than black people aware. So as the white people kept standing up, and I'm dragging the black people mm -hmm. to stand up. So the battle, the biggest battle was the minds of, of black people. When I started doing the gang summits, I did them all the way across America, right? Save as many black boys as I could. Black people talking. Spike Moss is only bringing them gangs together so he can control the, the drugs that come into the black community. No, they, they they shooting each other. I want this to stop. Absolutely. <laughs> I got on planes and buses, and I went all over America and did gang summits. So I'm just saying it's that kind of damage. So to your point, the most important thing is organize, organize, organize the same thing they told us. Mm -hmm. So when you organize, it's how you learn. Fannie Lou Hamer, for me, was the greatest black woman I've ever met. She lived in the Mississippi Delta. She's the one to organize the sharecroppers and the farmers to stand up and fight for the right to vote. That was not Martin. It was Fannie Lou Hamer, Ruby, Mississippi. Think about Spike Moss, 17 years old, sitting at her feet, and she's teaching me, organize, and how you organize. Um, James Brown, I met him through music, but the lessons that I got from James Brown 
I was at home when he called me long distance. Spike, I got something going to help you out. I said, what is that, brother? I got a song. <laughs> Say it loud. I'm black like and I'm, I'm proud. I said, let me hear it a little bit. And he played it. I said, brother, you ain't going to get that on the radio. <laughs> I was serious. I'm not lying. I said, you ain't going to get that. It was on the radio bigger than life. So when I brought him to Minneapolis, from Penn Avenue all the way down to about Knox, it was all black people because he did that one song. The, you couldn't see the ground. They came from St. Paul, South Side, North Side, because I put it on the, on the radio. And it was just full of black people to see James Brown. But they don't know what I'm telling you about the messages. When I met Muhammad Ali, he came to the way. It started a relationship. He's flying me to his fights. But every time I'm going somewhere, we're talking. He's picking my brain. He's not knowing I'm picking his. You see what I'm saying? So that relationship went on. What is it? Organizing. Teaching. Then Ray Allen, I met him. He's a corporate brother. He went to school. He was a track star. He went to school with Dick Gregory. He says, Spike, my best friend is Dick Gregory. I think that's somebody you're going to have to meet to do what you're trying to do. I said, well, when he comes, just introduce me. That was a lifelong teacher for me, Dick Gregory. I spoke at his funeral in Washington. You see what I'm saying? So when I'm speaking about organizing, I'm speaking for what it did for me, how it helped me, even the little people who grabbed me and taught me and told me things that I needed to know. Without that, I couldn't have done what I did for black people, or I would have gave up because of the confusion we're talking about right now. They don't want to do nothing. They're not ready. They let me understand why. So in spite of, so when I'm in groups of black men, especially in prisons, I did three prisons a week for 39 years, Stillwater, St. Cloud, Shakopee. Mm-hmm. I also did uh, state federal uh, up there in, in uh, Sandstone down in Rochester, but I also did state and federal going across, right? Mm-hmm. So when I'm talking to these people, I'm talking about organizing. I'm talking about rebuilding yourself. I'm talking about never coming back. And then I would insult them. I'm not upset about how many of you are in this prison. I'm not upset about how much time you got. I'm not even upset about how you got here and when you come home. I'm upset because I know the majority of you are here for doing something to somebody who looked like me. Mm -hmm. Time for you to change. And I stood on it. So other prisons would send kites to other inmates, invite me to their prison. That's how I ended up walking across America with it, right? So I think that's the key is what the elders gave me and taught me, and I now put it to work. You see, uh, my, through education, I did Operation Shame Gang. I did each one teach one. Uh, Gwen Davis Powell brought us to Antioch College and put it right in the community. You know, so we were always learning. Syl Davis made sure that Mahmoud El Khadi taught all of us our history and our culture when we were real young. He was teaching us this, and so they got to go through what we went through, and then you got to do something else. You got to fall in love with each other in order for it. That's got to be the glue once I teach you to hold you together. We've never had a generation where they totally, uh, totally taught to hate one another at the level they taught this generation. Mm-hmm. They hate the sight of each other. Yep. We were pushing love. You were called sisters, <laughs> flowers. You see what I'm saying? He's saying something we, our mothers didn't allow us to, our daddies didn't allow us. Matter of fact, uh, if the sister caught you saying it and stood up to you, we're going to check you. And if you raise up on her, you've got a spanking coming from them young brothers standing right there. That's what we were taught. Uh, men are cowards to beat women. Your job is to protect women. Your job is to respect women. So you could never, and, if she, and she would sometimes do it. What did you call me? Well, we slow down. What did he call her? <laughs> you see? But that's when we were connected in a bond of love. That's when the spirituality was in us because we were in Sunday school. Mm-hmm. See, we were in the church. We were learning God's way. So to me, that's the bottom line of what you're saying is organize, organize, organize. And the advantage we have is the black church. Sit down in the church and organize. If you don't come back for Sunday school, sooner or later you will. But at least you're organizing in that basement in your own space. Hmm. So correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> Or maybe I should just ask, um, mm. why do you think people in your community don't engage 
on a civic level? Like, why aren't they voting? Why aren't they going into the policy making process saying this is a problem? Why aren't my leaders fixing this? Well, you can't really uh, fix it, fix it. What happened was rule America had stayed almost 100 percent racist. And that's why in most capitals, no matter what state you go to, is ran by the Republicans. The Republicans took the most racist stands, so the most racist people would rally and run to them consistently as they voted against everything we deserve consistently. I just said to uh, um, people from the Capitol, I spoke to them uh, Tuesday, uh, 1, 2 o'clock, and I said to them that, you know, the biggest insult of this all is even though we have a very small population in the state of Minnesota, this small population gives the state of Minnesota over four billion dollars a year, and we can't go ask for a hundred thousand or four billion. So the white majority will spend its money on what it wants, and then spend our money on what we want. Well, that's called taxation without representation. That's against the law. You would expect the law to correct it. Mm-hmm. So why would you believe the law didn't correct it? Then they did that study that said Minnesota banks are the worst banks and the entire country towards black people. They said, of those banks, Wells Fargo is the worst, and after them is a U.S. bank. Here's the deal. Red line is illegal. <laughs> when is the president <laughs> of the bank going to jail? When is the board of directors going to go to jail? You red line it to the point of this. White people have 74 to 76 percent of all the mortgages. Black people don't have 2 percent. Mm-hmm. White people have 99.5% of the businesses from the top of Minnesota to the bottom. Blacks don't have half of 1%. There's something going on here that's different. And when you don't see it's a level that's beyond even the south of hate, you don't believe there's a reason to go to the polls because what my ancestors went through in Minnesota, I'm going through. Here's the greatest insult. My people... On my dad's side came from Mississippi. It's the most backward, broken state in the Union, country. Most of their masters was uneducated, spoke broken English. When we came up north, that's why we were speaking broken English, because we came from those type of masters. Minnesota is filthy rich. Minneapolis, for a long time, is listed as the fourth richest city in the world, not the country, the world. But here's the deal. In broke Mississippi... More black people have mortgages than Minnesota. Most black people have businesses than Minnesota. Most black people's kids go to school and graduate than Minnesota. Most black people's kids go to college and graduate than Minnesota. Most black people have more elected officials down there than Minnesota. So that means there's something different here. One of the things that I recognize in a protest I did yearly Matter of fact, the last picture I did it, it's hanging in my house, is me and Paul Wellstone leading it. And he was a congressman at the time. We're the only state where all the racist groups are at. And they will show up at the Capitol on the step every year. And I have a picture of me and him going against them. How is it that all of them could survive here, where over here you might have the Klan, over there you might have skinheads, over here you might have skinhead and Klan? We got them all. And then we got homegrown, all American boys and stuff like that. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So the organizing is so crucial. And when you can't see the freedom, and to your point, you just had one of the greatest examples in your face. It was George Floyd. Mm. You do know that first-degree murder comes with intent. Mm-hmm. You have to intend to kill. Mm-hmm. You have and this is where I say God is good. I don't know if you've seen this, but this, this is how I knew God was there. On that day, Native Americans, Latinos, mm-hmm. white people, mm-hmm. African Americans, all together, yep. only God could have put that bouquet of flowers right there together. Yep. And then they went in harmony like a church choir. Stop. You'll kill him. Mm-hmm. Let him up. Let him go. Right there should have scared you because no one mm-hmm. else could have gathered all those nationalities. Mm-hmm. Everybody got a job. How did they all get there at one time, the witnesses? And then you didn't see the other side of the street till they started showing the other footage later. Mm-hmm. That They were on, all the way around was everybody mm-hmm. at that time. So to me, that's God. He said, it's not only going to happen. 
You're going to witness it, and you're going to force, be forced to make some decisions. So when it happened, that's first-degree murder. You're still in Minnesota. Not one of them has been charged with first-degree murder. Nope. Not one of them have the time in jail that comes with first-degree murder. Nope. Minnesota went out of its way to let them go home. Yep. The white lady that shot right out there in Brooklyn Park, she has no record. Out of that two years, she's going to do five to six months yep. for cold-blooded murder where she's hollering, taser, 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 and, and never no. reached on the side where the taser was, reached on the side where the gun was. And then the, the, one of the footages that they took down almost immediately was the officers with her. When they backed away, what are you mm-hmm. doing? On the camera. So when you see that, How can you believe there's a chance or my vote matters when they should have took care of this, what, generations ago? Hmm. Well, Spike, that's only because of Republicans. No, no, no. There have been Democrats and Republicans as president. None have set us free. Mm -hmm. None have gave us our basic rights. And so the one thing that they're hiding behind that they know we can't fight is what I called in to Artis and said, the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. They can always fall back on the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment erased us. It said that all men are created equal with certain alienable rights. But the black man, he's only three-fifths human. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The Native American, he's other. Mm -hmm. So where did he come from? Moon, Mars? He's other under Mm -hmm. that. And we are not man under that. So all the laws that come, come under the 14th Amendment... And you're not there. Now, our people don't even know that. What they know is that we ain't never going to get treated fairly. We ain't never going to get justice. No one in office is ever going to help us. Think about if everybody of Trump's mind becomes the majority at the Capitol, guess what's the first thing they're going to vote? 14th Amendment. And now they don't have to worry about you at the polls because you ain't got a reason to go anywhere. You can't vote. And right now you're voting as a privilege, not under the protection of the law. Not under the protection of the law. Um, out of all that, you just said so many things. Um, so one of the things when you were talking about earlier, like um, the organizing or um, one of the things you said about the young people mm-hmm. that didn't have anything to lose. Mm-hmm. So I feel like, um, and God rest George So that's my friend. We're both from Houston. Mm-hmm. So that pains me to my soul because I know him. And um, one of the things right there that I thought all through the whole unrest, the burning of the city, they have just upset a group of people who don't have anything to lose. Because like you said, the elders praying, trying to be as peaceful Wait, as we could be. Uh, be. Peaceful, marching and talking. Them youngsters went crazy. Just went absolutely crazy. And for the way you just described the rainbow of color of people, people that should have been at work, like the one lady, she was an EMT. Mm-hmm. She wasn't even in her uniform, standing there on the side, Pleading. telling them, please, Pleading. get up off of him. Let me help him. Get up. <laughs> let me help him. Let me look <laughs> at him. They wouldn't even take a notice. Little children, old people, black people, white people, everybody was there to witness this on Power a first-hand account. Power of God. And that's all. Oh, my goodness. I've never even looked at the rainbow. Now I see... Every time I think about um, how Floyd was took, one of the first things we did when we had our first bloom release at the building I work at, I spoke about Floyd. If any one of the people who ever crossed paths with George Floyd would have known that this is what it was, I described him as an angel walking with us, and we didn't even realize who he was. Until his life was being snatched and stolen away. And then it still took some time after that for people to really realize it. Just like on the news yesterday. They still got some stuff going on. I jumped up and ran downstairs and told my daddy. I said, Daddy, Floyd is still changing the world. Especially with them going back, bringing the... um. The um the witness man the mm-hmm. the um 
who is the man? He was the special. He came and testified mm. for Derek Chauvin mm. as far as being the medical examiner. Mm-hmm. So now they done went back in his record. He was 17 years doing these cases. They have brought up 100 of his cases that they're going to go back through because of the statements he made at the George Floyd trial. One uh, uh, black man who holds an office in D.C. wrote a whole letter. He got 400 doctors to sign on to this paper for them to open up them 100 cases looking at that man's record just due to the statements he made here in Minnesota at the trial. So it's still moving and it's still well, it's gonna, going. The one thing we have an advantage, um, anything to investigate in Minnesota is going to come out the same. Now, I say that from this standpoint. I'm, I'm handling my first police problem in 1966 mm-hmm. when they beat a 14-year-old black girl up in broad daylight downtown, no crime committed. And they let the officers go. They beat her with nightsticks for no reason because she got pushed off the curb. Turned to get back up on the curb, they started beating her. Um, the city council, from that time to this moment, never suspended one officer, never fired one officer. The county attorney never fired or charged one officer. They never went to court or trial or jail or prison or federal. The mayors of Minneapolis never fired, never won. The Capitol never passed any bills to stop it. Each governor, state representative, senator, the three of them never Pass anything to protect us. Mm-hmm. Now, here's where it gets worse. Clyde Belcourt is the leader here for the Native Americans, and he was one of the founders of AIM. I did 42 years of taking Native American cases between them and police with him. And one day we got a call. And the call was, y'all keep fighting for all this the police do, but none of y'all stand up with all these missing Native American women. Mm-hmm. Clyde and I stood up. We went to the people. They put on TV. We don't know what we're talking about. Ain't no missing Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Ain't nobody did that. They vilified us. This year, they finally announced mm-hmm. they were killing about 52, 53 every month. Mm-hmm. And you don't find the bodies. So I say all that is Minnesota history is what I'm getting to. So how can black people or Native Americans see daylight when they've never been allowed to see daylight? Mm -hmm. You you, you follow what I'm saying? So I'm not just talking to somebody who's just acting a fool. I'm talking to somebody that the disbelief was planted in him on purpose by the disrespect and the abuse. You see what I'm saying? Yep. And so... um, Even when I fought our right to do things, think about this conversation. The bus company pays more money than most jobs, 60s and 70s. But they have full benefits, medical, dental, and retirement. I want my people to drive the bus. Here comes the conversation. It doesn't make any difference what color the driver is. Just get on the bus and ride. What did I just say? It it brings. Watch that out. Doesn't matter, Mr. Moss, what color the teacher is. Just get your kids ready to come to school and learn. Mm -mm. (laughs) (laughs) And the worst one was the fire department. We fight, we fight, we fight. I'm not going to say it on the radio, but you you can get what I'm saying. Well, as the chief, why don't you want black people to be firefighters? If we hire those ends, we'll have to sleep with them. Just can't make it. That ain't Mississippi. That ain't Alabama. Nope, that ain't Arkansas. Right here. Yeah, that's Minnesota. Right here. Right, right here. And there's this like weird sense. I think Minnesotan, especially Minneapolis, is this idea that like, no, we're the good guys. But, hey, but that a, mentality is almost like just as dangerous as just being blatantly. Well, the mentality. You think about it being consistent. First of all, you're an anti-slave state. You bought and sold slaves. Mm-hmm. And they built the fur industry and they did all the mining and a lot of cave-ins that was us. Um, and then you had Calhoun before Mondale and Humphrey were, um, were a vice president. Calhoun was. 
and they named the biggest lake in the city after Calhoun. But when he was vice president in an anti-slave state in Washington, D.C., he voted for slavery from Minnesota. He also married in the Magnolia family in Carolina. And the Magnolia family has the largest uh, plantation in history. It's like 5,000 acres, not including the water. He married one of his daughters, and he's your representative going forward to Washington, D.C. So, I mean, the history is that old consistently without changing. And uh, the last lynching in the state, of course, was Duluth, three black men working in a carnival. Um, then you got Mankato. Mankato is the city, uh, 72, 73 miles from here. It's the city where um, on a given day, the white people made a decision. They're going to lynch 400 Native American men, women, and children on a given day. That was the time when Lincoln did stand up, he, but he did it kind of crazy. I can't let you hang that many people. Go to the St. Paul Capitol, count the steps, mm -mm. and that's how many you can hang. And Mankato hung 30-some Native American men, women, and children for no reason. Mm -mm. So, I mean, when you got it in you to do all the above, and our people witnessed it for all these generations, everybody got some particular pain mm -hmm. from something here if you live here. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, one person said to me one day, I was speaking at a college, well, if it's so bad here, why don't you leave? And I, and I had to say, sir, I don't want to do this, but I got to do this to you. What state are you recommending for me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. What, what state are you recommending? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Black people in the 60s did not call this United States. They called it the United Snakes. So where are you telling me to go? Mm -hmm. See? And here's the other thing they say. Love it or leave it. Well, if you've been here, you show you don't love it. <laughs> you ain't left it. You know, you're destroying everything you can destroy here. Mm -hmm. But you want somebody to love. Or if you say something about slavery, get over it. How do you get over 240-some years mm. of being treated as less than a man, less than a woman, less than a child? And snap your finger and forget it. And the reason you can say that, you've never been faced with Anybody telling you the history of slavery, what all went with it. So you got us thinking because we went to school, we were singing happily in a field picking cotton because we don't know the history of slavery and the brutality of slavery and the madness of slavery. They didn't want us to know that. And so we didn't decide to pick it up. We decided to leave it alone. It's these veins of slavery, of racism, um, it's when people say get over it it's the modern day or there's racism isn't here the impact it's had on the black community on on communities of color in general is directly related to like why we're seeing voter lower voter turnout well and, they don't they're getting to a point where they loved america in spite of and america is now destroying the last thing we had which is our love you know, I, w I was talking to a group um, last week, and they were talking about all the ref refugees down there at the southern border. Mm -hmm. And one of them made a mistake of saying to me, they need to go back home, and they need to so and so and so. And it went on and on and on. So I'm listening, listening, listening. And I didn't buddy, and finally one of them said, well, Mr. Moss, what's your take on it? And I said, first of all, those are not Mexicans. That was forced on them from the Spanish invaders. They made them Mexicans. Those people are Native Americans returning back home. That's all they're doing. They're not aliens. <laughs> this is where they lived. Now, I said to that group, we can go to New York and capture us a pigeon and put him in a box. His brain is about the size of a black eyed pea. Mm -hmm. Once we get to L.A., we can open the box and he will fly us behind back home. you telling me a fool man with a fool brain will never come back home? just because you put him through so much. So the Spaniards were here 150 years before white people. They put a colony on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. So a lot of what you see is a Spanish name. So you confuse that with Native Americans because that's who conquered them. Mm -hmm. And in that area, all the way to L.A., that's their big chief, who they would call the King Montezuma. See, they were short people. A darker skin, jet black hair, shorter than all of us, right? So when you say out of slang L.A., 
you miss the noise. The noise is Los Angeles, mm. San Diego, Santa Monica, San Francisco, Arizona. You miss it. Colorado. You miss the Spanish language pushed in those Native Americans that lived in that area, naming where they live. Colorado. And then Colorado is a place called El Dorado. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you miss it because they don't teach you history, but theirs. Theirs. So here they come back years and years later across the border and they're illegal aliens and refugees. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And because you don't know them. Now, when you see them and they're six foot or you see them and they have a pale color, mm -hmm. that's the ancestry of the Spaniard still with that Native American. But most of the time, they don't claim the oppression. Mm -hmm. They claim the Native. So we see them short. We don't know. That's the original. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that whole area from California running all over New Mexico, Arizona, over there where Vegas is, all of that was them. See? And it's the history that will set us free. And then we won't join in and say stupid stuff like they need to go back home. Mm -hmm. They did. Mm -hmm. they yep, did they are. Home. They're yeah. trying to get back right now. <laughs> yeah. While y'all playing. Uh. Um, I know one of the things you have brought up was about the 14th Amendment. So um, right now in America as it stands, as far as like the um, the voting laws go, mm -hmm. how they keep on changing stuff, um, redoing these uh, lines that they keep on talking about. We got to redo the lines. We got to divide the state, yeah. the gerrymandering going on. Um, do you feel? Nope. I want you to tell me what do you, um, the 14th Amendment, because for me, just for me, what I'm thinking and seeing is that they're just trying to, um, they're still pushing us. They're still, um, they took, they say they took slavery away, but at some point it's still enslavement going on. It's still enslavement happening. So um, do you feel like the 14th Amendment is in jeopardy in any kind of way of being um, took away as um us as a black people or African American people having our um, rights to vote or to still um, participate? Are we in jeopardy of losing? Well, well, you said it yourself. You said <laughs> right. You had no right to vote. You're not included. <laughs> See, the point is this. If enough of Trump-minded people mm -hmm. get in office, mm -hmm. they don't have to meddle with you voting anymore. They just bring up the amendment mm -hmm. and go back there. You officially have no right, no right to vote. It's what you need to be afraid of by not going to the polls. Mm -hmm. You got to go to the polls to make sure because this group understands use all weapons. But they knew they didn't have enough votes in Washington to use it. But if you can get it. And get them to the poll. All right, let's re-invoke the 14th Amendment. Because it ain't never been challenged. If I needed to change, why didn't I change it? Mm -hmm. If I knew it wasn't fair, why isn't it gone? They left it there. So I'm saying there's a piece of law and legislation there that should have been destroyed generations ago. So you have to ask yourself a question. Why did you keep it? Mm -hmm. And right now, it's a good question for that side because they can say, no, I didn't do anything to you. It's it's, it's right. already rolled down. It's right here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Minnesota. Minnesota has something called um, general assistance. Mm. There's a lot of people on mm -hmm. general assistance. But in 2013, Minnesota voted to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I mean by that? I can take it when I want to. I voted already to get rid of it. Mm. So you got to understand what that means. Now, uh, that check is re uh, associated with hard time, mm -hmm. struggle. But 2013, you voted to get rid of it. You'll be shocked. I, look at my, my check. My check was supposed to be here today. Oh, we stopped that. But when did you stop it? Mm -hmm. I didn't get no. It was 2013. <laughs> you just took it off the table. Nobody took it off the noticed. table. So you got a law here. In place that we don't have to bother you at the polls. We don't have to do nothing. Just get enough people in office mm -hmm. to revoke it because it ain't went nowhere. It's still a law of the land. It's still on there. Can you um, break down so there's, our audience might not have like any 
political background and knowledge. So um, can you break down the 14th Amendment briefly in context, too? Well, the most powerful thing about it is the way it even starts. All men are created equal with certain inalienable rights. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's supposed to speak for all men. But then you put in the same piece of paper, a black people, three-fifths human, Native American other. So that means there's no inclusion for life. But here's what's dangerous about it. Everything you really have of importance is in that. Because that speaks to your humanity. That speaks to your citizenship. That speaks to your freedom and your justice. So when you're not under that, you lose much more than that. If anybody really brings it back by the closet and uses it, we lose all kinds of stuff. You can't just move in a neighborhood of your choice, go to public school because you want to go. Everything is associated with freedom. You don't have freedom. And you're not protected under that amendment that they left there. See? Mm. And then the other thing that, sh- that proves that I'm right, when they couldn't get what they wanted and the South refused to, to bend and give in, they told them, you're responsible for your own state. And that's when the South them did Jim Crow and all the other stuff before they even called it Jim Crow. They just let them run amok. And I believe it by heart of hearts. Donald Trump has called on those believers that believe in racism and hate to come together if we don't go to the polls and one too many of them get elected, this is threatening because it stops mm-hmm. everything else. It will stop us from going to court and suing for civil rights, human rights. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're, you're back to just the business courtroom and that's it. Yeah. And you have no protection under civil rights because you're no longer property. I'll give it to you when I want to. Here's what they say about that. Y'all both watched it on the news before. So-and-so had such and such happen. And we're going to look and see if his civil rights are violated. Who's looking to see? The very people who violated it. Yep. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Exactly. So, so I'm telling you that. Um, oh, no, nope, they weren't violated. There you go. All the time, <laughs> right? So I'm just saying that this election coming mm-hmm. up will be the next and the most important in the lives of people of color because they're trying to go back full circle to the 1800s with that madness. Um there's so many of them alive at the Capitol, and they publicly let it be known year after year after year. They just needed another Hitler to lead them, and Donald Trump came along. One. And, and, and remember when they was in the streets, they did him like this when they was in the streets. It was straight to Hitler. And then in Carolina, they were hollering out loud, the Jews will not replace us. The Jews will not replace mm-hmm. us. All that's Hitler. But think about it. World War I, one of the countries that four out of five people believed in what Hitler was doing right here four out of five mm-hmm. there were so sympathizers here they were everywhere uh what's his name Lindbergh the, the pilot here what was his name Charles Flo the plane yeah is that right yeah strong 100 <laughs> percent you know what I'm saying right here in Minnesota 100 percent so every year the Nazis got love here you know about channel five channel five would do a documentary on Hitler every year <laughs> did you know that nope no when their owner was in that building, every year you had to watch that documentary on, <laughs> on Hitler. But we had Nazi organizations here, German organizations here. This one to get you. And I can say this because I don't, I don't have to say their names. White officers came to me. Spike, we need to know, can we trust you? We got something we got to share with you. I said, what is that? We got a real problem downtown in the courthouse. I said, well, you can trust me. What is it? Too many white officers are coming to work and bringing their Nazi uniforms in mm. and hanging them in the locker and showing them off, trying to get us to join. You need to go down and see about it. I go down there, and the chief at that time, I go down there and see him, and he argues about that can't be, it ain't true, so on, so on, so on. But because it's you, Spike, I'm going to go down there and see. He came back and he said these words. This is going to get you. You're right. I didn't find but three, but I found them down there. He said, but I've talked to them, and those men have gave me their word. They will not bring those uniforms back to work. Boy. I said, sir, the uniform is now in the car, and the Nazi attitude is on the streets of Minneapolis with a badge? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, that uniform's still in their minds. Yeah, that's where it is. (laughs) The uniform is in their mind. Said it to my face. You you see what I'm saying? And who had the power? He did. Yeah. He did not say suspended. He did not say fire. He did not say we're going. We're not going to have that. He did not say you're going to take it to the city council, to the mayor. 
And he was comfortable telling me they gave me their word. That they won't do it. They won't, won't bring it down there anyway. <laughs> I mean, I'm not surprised necessarily just based on what I've witnessed in my lifetime of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, these failures in, in policing. Uh, well, that's what hits, to her point, that's what hits our people and their unwillingness to go out and vote. The belief has been knocked right up out of their soul, their mouth, their heart. They just, they've never got justice. What, what's really tragic is when you see little children stand in front of a TV and see it, and they say this to their mama. They ain't going to do nothing, are they, mama? They already know. Yep, nothing's happening. They already know. Okay, um, I have one last and final question for you. And I think this is the part just going to do me in. <laughs> so, if you could go back. And talk to that 12-year-old, the one 12-year-old you was talking about that stood up that day. If you could go back and talk to that 12-year-old right now, knowing the things that you know um, and through your walk of life, what would you tell him? I would tell him what my grandparents and all of them told me. This is what it is. This is what's going to happen. And this is what you got to deal with. And then this is how you're going to deal with it. I would not let him go unprepared into this world. I would share with him every example I could possibly share with him and every story that they gave me. I would share it so that you don't get hit blindly, so you don't get your heart broke the way my mother got her heart broke with a, with a goal and a dream at 17 that she couldn't stop bragging about to us. When, when I get to Minnesota, I'm on this because when I was a girl, I had that. And then she got up there and it really was a school. So, I mean, it's important to leave your legacy in them but it's important to tell them their destiny and their future and must, what must be done and what you got to do to lift up your people. There's no way I would let them blindly run out in this world like that. You know, it's like it's, it's a thunderstorm and you ain't tell the kid to stay in the house or get an umbrella, or get a trench coat, and he's dashing out the door. You can't do that. You got to go ahead and just tell them the truth. Too many of us are not telling them anything. You got to tell them the truth. You, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You got to tell them the truth. When, when we sent our kids over to the Northeast, which is the best example, busing came and they sent them over there to Northeast to school. It was the parents that showed up with bats and started whooping our kids. And many of the adults in the community today will tell you, I organized those black men in more than 100 car caravan to go Northeast and get our children and bring them back to safety. Many of the children that were there to witness that will tell you about that story. They weren't in Alabama. They were over in northeast Minneapolis going to school their first day. They prepared to beat them on the first day. Because Minnesota's in control of Channel 4, 5, 9, and 11, we saw Little Rock. We didn't see Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> so um, I just want to tie a, you mentioned Frederick Douglass. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is kind of my last uh piece unless there's more that you'd like to talk about but uh, I saw a lot of alignment with some of the topics you spoke on already um, but w- can you just briefly tell me about Frederick Douglass's story and the power of his experience mm-hmm. what he did at the you know as a freed slave who knew how to read was a amazing public orator mm-hmm. speech giver um, like, what's the power of his story that you think translates to today? The, the, the power of his story is from nothing to something. I'm put to be a slave. I'm put to be broken. I'm put to have my spirit, my love of self all taken. And out of that, he struggled to get free. Out of that, one day he was free. Out of that, when he got free, this is the most important part of what she keeps talking about. He thought about the rest of us. He thought about freeing the rest of us. He thought about the hell that he went through. He didn't want no more of us to go through. He was not selfish. He opened his arms like this, and I'm going to run the risk. I'm going to open my mouth. I'm going to speak up. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to everybody I can go to. That man had so many doors open uh, as a man who at the point uh, could not represent being African. He could only represent being slave. And you're trying to fight from that position into humanity to even open your mouth. And many of the audiences that he went to, the person that killing could have been there. 
So the bravery and, and the intelligence, uh, uh, being self-taught like Lincoln, you know, uh, and the intelligence, uh, he figured it all out and then he could bring it from his mouth to where it really was to the world. There's so many things that were so strong and great about him, I, I wouldn't really know where to start because um, you wouldn't know this, but a many a black person, when you got caught with a book in your hand, you lost that hand. If you got caught looking in it, they put your eyes out. If they heard you saying the words, they cut your tongue. People don't know where we really came from mm -hmm. with the issue of education. Mm. And, and even when we worship God and we use the Bible, we had to sneak in the woods in the darkness. So can you imagine what he's coming from to, to try to tell a country that don't care his truth? And, and not only his truth, what he experience in his life what he witnessed you can't be a person on a plantation and you witness no beatings you witness nobody being castrated you wish witness nobody being whipped or salt dumped in their wounds you can't be a person put in slavery and didn't witness this person that person's mother get raped this person that person's daughter because the word was she's had her period she's ready for sex eight, nine, ten years old, carried, carrying them to the big man's house. Or because many of the masters were homosexual, our boys were in the same problem as our mothers and daughters. And, and when you come off a plantation, you are terrified mm -hmm. by all. And it's, so most people, if they got away like him, <laughs> you don't want just nobody to know. Yeah, you don't want nobody. This man just... You know, through all 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 them years of life, he 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 got to have a story. The ones I got from my from my grandfather, them. You know, my 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 uh, un youngest uncle, he lived in Monroe City. My grandfather, my great grandfather, was the last slave. His name's William. This is a good one. He lives in Monroe. That's where he was a slave. I would come down and ask my uncle, the baby boy, where is William buried, and he would drop his head and, and walk away. So I asked him one year, and he teared up and he didn't say nothing. So when he got sick, I didn't know he was sick. I didn't know he was dying. I came down to see him, and I'm sitting in the house talking, talking, and he say, come on, get in the car. We're going somewhere. So I got in the car, and he told me to drive over to Paris and then go north. So I went north for three miles. He said, get out of the car. I got out of the car. He walked me in this field, tall grass, You've been bothering me about it for years. I said, bothering about what? You want to know where William is? I said, of course I do. He's my great-grandfather. He's right here. I said, uncle, he ain't right here. This ain't no graveyard. He said, you don't understand slavery. This is where you dunk, dump your cattle, your donkeys, your mules, your horses, your pigs, your sheep, and your niggas. This is where you dump them. You bag them, you wrap them, you bury them, you leave them. Watch what you ask for. This man seen all of that. I was devastated. I begged for it. My eyes swelled up. I started sweating. I had to call my sister long distance because I had an out of body experience. I backed up from the field to the dirt road without backing up. Mm. So I had to call my sister and tell her. I said, them slaves were howling so loud in that field that the spirit hit me to the point I could not see, and I backed up to the road. Um, your brother's not crazy. I had an out-of-body experience from the pain and the suffering in that field. So when you see Frederick Douglass, who was there, I'm just in the mm -hmm. graveyard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that hit me on God. That hit me that day. And I never went back to that cemetery mm -hmm. to this day. I know where it's at now, but I never went back. So I'm just saying... The baggage he was carrying as he was standing up for you and me, mm -hmm. the, the relatives, the friends, the children, in his head and his heart, oh, my God, mm -hmm. what a burden. And then turn around and be your champion. Turn around and be your champion with courage and boldness and bravery and determination and would not quit or give up. But once again, like I said about little Spike Moss, look at all the white allies he had. Mm-hmm. Huh? And look where they took him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just got to find them. <laughs> That's all you got to do. You got to find them. He found them. And they kept him moving. 
kept him eating, placed to sleep, on his feet, moving his mission. But I don't think, other than Jesus, I heard of a greater love of a people than what he had in him to sacrifice himself. And that's not to knock Moses, you know what I'm saying, or Jesus. But mm -hmm. he's in that category where I'm going to do it for you at all costs to me. Only thing I hope is one day you remember me. And as your co-host, Darlene Phillips, will be signing off on our podcast now. You gentlemen have a wonderful day. Thank you again, you Spike. You do the same. Thank you. Bye.